there's a lot of people in this room who are either double majors or maybe have a minor in theater, but they are majors in the business world. They're anxious to hear what you have to say. So can we start our advice portion? Uh, if I knew then what I know now, or just really good advice that you can give everybody here in parlaying theater schools into the corporate world. Yeah. Um, so first off, it'll be okay. Um, I, when I graduated in 2009, the economy had just entered this new, you know, realm um, in 2008. So we're coming into it and out of it. Um, so I understand what you're going through and what you're up against and what your parents are putting pressure on you about. Um, so it will be okay. Um, and so I think the biggest thing that I wish I knew then, which I knew now, is that um, whatever you major in is not what you will do. Um, so if you are an, I don't know, if you're an English major, what are you going to do? English? You know, that's not a verb. If you're an account, if you're going to be, you know, some things are. You can be an accountant. You can be an economist. Um, you can be a biologist. But it's more about what you do and the experiences and the internships you have rather than what's just on a piece of paper defining what you think you should do. So there's no one path, there's no if I do this, then I'll do that. As you can see, we've all had a similar based education and so many different paths, so many different ways we've gone. Um, so it's really about how you spin it and about how you spend your time in your internship. So that's probably the biggest thing I can say um, from what I like to see when I'm hiring undergrads um, or entry level roles is as much experience as you can. Um, I don't expect you to be a whiz at everything you do, but I expect people to use their time in undergrad wisely, um, get internships, get experience, shadow, whatever you can do. Just It's a cafeteria line. Just try as much as you can. Um, and that's really going to help form to what you really want to do, which you shouldn't know coming out of your senior year in college. Um, it's something that develops much more over time. Um, so get as much experience as you can. Um, and also, you know, with that, it's really about using your theater education into so much more than that. Um, and you have to educate the non-theater people of the world of how much work you do and <laughs> everything that you do. So, you know, right off the bat, you have an upper hand on so many other undergraduates, people fighting for the same jobs and internships you do, because as someone involved in theater education, or if you are doing theater productions, you are working in high pressure situations, you are multitasking, you are communicating, you're creative, you're doing project management. Um, most of you probably can look someone straight in the eye and project with a nice voice. Um, you know, these are things that a lot of people don't have here at Fairfield and at other undergraduate programs too. So. You have to spin what you are doing currently into something that the business, you know, the non-theater world can understand. So when you're thinking about, when you're prepping for a job interview, when you're thinking about things, maybe just even after you do a show, think about the experience. You know, if you journal it, if you just unpack it, and then try to transcribe that into maybe not using, te you know, theater terms. So someone might not know what a, you know, a prop master is. Someone might not know what a stage manager is. But really think about that, how it can transcend into, I'm doing project management, um, I'm working with my peers, I'm managing this, I'm creative, I'm doing timelines, you know, everything, whatever you're trying to do for the job. Um, I would sometimes, I still do it now when I'm going on interviews, um, not that I'm interviewing, um, but the, you know, say, say something to a roommate who doesn't know anything about the inner works of theaters or a family member and see if they get it, see if they get what you're trying to do without the theater jargon, because um, it really does, everything you do transcends to other things. It's just spinning it into something that makes you so much more of a competitive candidate than, um, you know, you might think you are. So to mention the theater stuff 100% um, in your interviews and on your resumes and your cover letters, um, it is a basis of training that a lot of people in arts and sciences can't get um, in the business program and other things because you are a leader in no matter what you're doing in a theater production. Um, and it's a really just about understanding that and then being able to communicate it to um, myself, whoever is interviewing you. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing, just knowing your worth um, in, a, in, a, you know, in theater education, theater production is huge. Um, and again, you are, you are here and everyone else is here because of your experiences you have with theater. Um, so get out there, and, but know what you're doing. Try to understand from a bigger sense of how this connects to maybe something other than theater, if that's what you're passionate about.
Right. Yeah. Thank you. Chris. I have to piggyback off of what you said. Yeah, my, uh, my husband went to Emerson College, and he graduated with a degree in musical theater. Um, and I met him seven years ago, but he wasn't an actor. He had just stopped acting the year before I met him. Uh, and he is now the chief of staff for a senator. So he works in politics, and he's very successful, and he's very good at it. And when he first started working in politics, he went on an interview, and this council member said to him, oh, I see you have a degree in theater. What skills do you have from that? And in the interview, Tim says, I'm using them right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he got the job. <laughs> uh, you know, thinking back to what you said, it's like, you know, what you're learning here is you're a step above everybody else because you know how to work together as a team. You know how to work hard. You know how to multitask. You know, you know how to project your voice and command a room and be confident. And that goes so far in interviews. Um, but to answer your question about I would probably take courses in areas that scare you. Um, take an economics course. Um, take a communications course. Um, take a course in accounting. I know it's boring, it's terrible, but just take it. And use, you know, use those things to, when you're taking that course, think to yourself, how can I apply this to making theater? Because you know, when you make theater, you're doing everything. So you need to know a lot, you need to know a little. You need to you need to know a little bit about everything, and sit there in your economics course and say, how what, how is this theory that I'm learning in economics apply to theater? Or in, when you're taking a communication course, how can I tie this into theater? Um, and that way, you'll get a you know a really well-rounded view of everything. Um, and summer internships. Um, uh, I found them very helpful. Um, you know, there you can. There are a lot of internships out there that pay and that provide housing. So you know, if a financial, if finance, you know, if you financially can't afford it, you know, do some research because a lot of places will pay for your housing and will give you a stipend, and it's manageable and it's doable and it's, and it's helpful in the long run. It's also good for just networking. Um, you know, you if you're working for, if you're interning for a theater company and you show your worth and you do a great job. When you get out of college, and if there's a position opening, like they might call you, they might want you back. Mm -hmm. um, so keep that in mind. And you know, in terms of the whole grad school thing, we talk about grad schools. Is you could go to grad school for free. Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. If I went to a three-year MFA program for free. I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I went to NYU. <laughs> you can do that. You know, there's the NETCs, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. is where you basically. It's a, does everyone know what this is? You go to a conference and you just do like one generic application and you interview at a, ho you know, at a yeah, hotel conference room with 10 different universities, you know, and uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing to do, but you could go to grad school for free if you want to do that. So, you know, put that money thing aside. Don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my advice. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, it's interesting. There seems to be a running theme here and that's uh, at one point in each one of our careers, we came up to a wall. Um, where we felt as though um, we, we, there was something that we, we didn't know what we didn't know, but we knew we needed to know it. And, um, <laughs> right? and, um, uh, and I, I think that's something that I, that I, I didn't, there are a couple of things, but um, when I was here, I didn't realize that, well, this was the end of my education. You know what I mean? I, I, re I, mean, I really thought when I was here that this, well, this my education's over, now I'm gonna go work. <coughs> and it never, ever stops. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, in the, in the last few years, I, you know, raised in the low seven figures of in investors' money to make projects of my own happen. And um, I have, I still probably don't really know, but I teach myself how to um, take um, someone who believes in you, take their money <laughs> and, um, and turn it into something viable and handle it appropriately and, um, uh, and then give a return on an investment. And uh, it's interesting that um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 44 years old at this point, and I'm and I'm still learning these things all the time. And um, uh, you you have to know that your education is just ongoing, and you're you're constantly going to be seeking out 
um, people and experiences and programs and um, degrees that will um, that will give you um, either an edge or will like you know sort of educate you you know to uh, um, figure out sort of how you can have a diverse and enriching career. Um, the other thing that I, I, I've been thinking about a lot is I remember sitting in this room and thinking, well, wouldn't it be amazing to have a, a career in, you know, a, as an actor or in the theater or in film or television? And thinking, well, that just doesn't happen for people like me. I mean, I'm just like some you know, nobody from the suburbs who went to a little school and um, you know, likes theater, mm -hmm. but I'm not exceedingly good looking. I'm not, you know, uh, no one's gonna hire me for my abs. You know, <laughs> so like, what, what's, what's the, uh, how, it doesn't happen. Because there's that weird adage, and I think it's to keep you out of the club, which is like, oh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. And I honestly am here to tell you that's complete and total BS. It has nothing to do with who you know, and everything to do with what you know. So, um, I, 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 you know, in a lot of ways there are these, okay, it's the difference between an LA actor and a New York actor. An LA actor is always like, what can you do for me? What can you do for me? And a New York actor is like, come see my show. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They have something uh, that they've figured out how to do that they want to offer you. And so, in a lot of ways, like tonight, I would encourage you um, to like, you know, find us on social media and, you know, get involved in the conversations and the sort of like worlds that are existing around our lives that are now all public, you know, and, um, but wait to ask your favor, you know what I mean? Mm, like, so don't be sweet. like, what can you do for me right now? I'm lost and I don't know what to do. I want to pick your brain, which to me is just like, my brain is so fried. You know, don't, don't pick my brain. <laughs> so what, what I would love is for you to sort of have a sense of what the world is that someone, you know, at my age is now moving in and start to like figure out, well, okay, there's all these little steps in between, um, but I know I can offer this. So you know, if, if it's that you've helped someone with a bunch of short films and you're just like ran around as a PA, just be like, listen, if you guys need a PA in your next film project, please consider me and here's my resume. That sort of thing. What can I do for free in your theater company? Like, what can I, you know, and I, and I think it's, about, it's a matter of sort of like finding a way to bring what you have at the stage that you're in. And a lot of it, and I'm gonna finish this up now, a lot of it is that you're gonna be working for free at first, period. And that's whether you're continuing your education, which I highly encourage. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean a graduate degree. I mean, there are part-time conservatory programs all over the city. Um, there are random classes that you could be taking that you think can help develop a certain skill. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I'm gonna wrap up there, but that's sort of like all of the jungle thoughts that I've had. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All that <laughs> and oh gosh, um, the first thing that the thing that that is like kind of esoteric, but really the most important thing I want to say to you guys is, you are the only you <laughs> in the world. That is what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. Comparison is the death of art and the death of happiness. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're going to go into a world, no matter what you choose to do. I mean, this is particularly, I, I'm coming at this particularly as an actor who makes my money in the business, so it's very complicated on that level. But I'm telling you, I see this for all of my friends. You know, all, all human beings go through this thing where they look across the way and they go, oh, I should be where that person is, or I want what that person has, or why don't I do it like that? And that is a vortex that you can be in for the rest of your life. And it's so tempting because we want to have goals and we want to, you know, identify the things that we want and, oh, I want a career like that. And in, and in this business, you're always told, like, find the person who, you know, the person who's your type or the person who has the career like what you want or the person who wrote the book that's like the book you want to write, whatever it is. That's all well and good, but you have to develop a system within yourself for, for limiting the amount of time you spend looking at what other people do. Because you, you can't, you can only do you. And, mm -hmm. and, and 
And when you get to the place where you start doing you, the response that you get is so overwhelming and, and supportive. And you know, it's, it's kind of similar to what you're saying about instead of what can you do for me, it's like, here's what I can do for you. Start identifying that stuff now. Um, because it's all gonna feed into what, what you end up being later. And, and you know, I, I'm not on Facebook, which is a deliberate choice in my life because I think that it's a lot of, you know, people shaping a story that they want you to believe is the truth. Mm -hmm. And somebody once made a comparison to me about how, you know, social media is everyone's highlight reel in your own mind, you're always watching your blooper reel. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you're always yeah. watching the bad things you do, the things that weren't right, the unattractive moments, the mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then you're out there looking at everybody's Facebook page and going, gosh, everybody's doing it better than mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So that's a myth. So just, you know, be on Facebook, be on social media. I'm on Twitter and I have a website and I'm very easy to find, but that was a dangerous place for me. It mm -hmm. really was. And particularly as a working actor in New York, woo, it's like everybody's yeah. writing their own reviews every day. It's like one big good selfie angle. Oh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's, it can be really, you know, it, it can be tough. And, you know, I'm married to another actor and learning about learning about how to live and be in love with another actor was is like the great journey of my life mm -hmm. and 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 both of our careers um managing those moments and starting to learn you know his successes and failures have nothing to do with my successes and failures or it's all the same you know mm -hmm. like his successes are my successes and do we really have any failures not really um, but it's 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 so important to find your quiet place your strength the people who are real with you and anybody who is not do not waste your time especially if you're with them because you think they can do something for your career mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people again, in all businesses who will use their position and their authority to make you feel less, um, to get things out of you for free. That's different than you doing an internship or doing a show for free because you're passionate about it and you're being treated well and you're around people you like. That's awesome. You don't have to get anything out of that except feeling great at the end of the day. But there are a lot of very dark corners in this in this world and we're so passionate that we walk into those dark corners like hi where, where'd the lights go you know we're not we're just not we're not the kind of people who walk into things with a big suit of armor we walk into things with our heart all exposed and what can i do and ready to go and let's make something and hang on to that with everything you have because that's what gets you through so Really quick, my, my anecdote is that my first and only thus far Broadway show, Enron, which was supposed to run forever, we were all under contract for a year, don't make any plans, this is the biggest show to hit the West End, and blah, 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 and we closed in two weeks. It was so good. But and it was fabulous. So good, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, I, when that show closed, and Ben Brantley decided it wasn't to his taste, um, I, I laid, he liked the London projection better. Yeah, yeah. I, yes. I, I laid on the floor of my apartment in Hell's Kitchen for like two weeks, and with like a carton of cigarettes and a bottle of Jack Daniels. I mean, it was classic. <laughs> I thought I was like Elaine Stritch. I don't know who I thought I was. <laughs> like, totally, like I remember answering the phone on the floor, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And my friend, my, one of my best friends uh, was living in LA at the time and she said, you know, your career is never going to be defined by how you deal with your successes. Your mm -hmm. career is going to be defined by how you cope with your failures. Absolutely. And that is the best advice, like practical advice that anyone ever gave me. Um, whether your failures are real or only perceived, it's how you choose to regroup, rebuild, focus on something new, find a new project, whatever it is, even to step back for a while. Lots of times this business is exhausting and you just have to step back from it for a minute, you know, and all of those things, the things that you, you do to, to, you know, rebuild yourself. That, and that's a skill that you can take anywhere, you know, learning how to do that. I mean, you know, I go on 500 job interviews a year Easily. Uh, 
makes me a little nauseous when I think about it that way, but it's true. And I don't get most of those jobs, but I get enough of them. And the ones that I get are the ones I choose to remember and focus on. I don't remember any of the ones I didn't get, or if they're like a good part, you know, party story. Can I piggyback on that really Please. quick? I, the, the Verizon job, there were, they interviewed 1,800 guys in five different cities, auditioned all of them, and I um, was the last appointment on the last day after they were like, let's see like 20 more guys. And, you know, I'm sort of funny looking. I, you know, I have a, a squeaky voice, and I, you know, I'm a little effeminate, and like all of these things that like make, you know, I'm not. No one's going to sell soap with me. You know what I mean? Like no one is going to be able to sell anything with this. And I, I got that job, and I found out only a couple years later that there was actually like a scientific list of 30 criteria that whoever got this job had to check every box. And it just happened that I, they ticked the 30 boxes. And that was it. And I got the job I mean, like immediately and signed to a contract for years and years and years. And the, the, the lesson that taught me is that it's not personal. That it's just showing up with everything you have in that moment and knowing that if, the, if all of the parts are aligned, um, you'll, you'll get that job. Yep. And then, and the, the 500 auditions, that's your job. Yep. That's your job. Yes. And oh. an opportunity to act and get better, everyone. Yes, so, exactly. Anyway. And thank you for reminding me, because that was the other thing that I wanted to say, is like, um, the, the, the art, I'll wrap up really quickly, but the, the art of this business, the thing that you love, is very different than the business of this business. Mm -hmm. Do not confuse the two. Yeah. Not everyone is made for the business of this business. And if you don't want to do that, you can have the art of it for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But you have to make the choices that allow you to have that. I have friends who came to New York for a year and were like, I can't do this. And these people have started theater companies in small towns and small cities and moved to Europe and taught and done all and had these incredibly fulfilling careers in art. Because the business of this business, I mean, I, you know, LA, forget it. But like even New York, it's tough. It's really, really tough, and I'm happy to talk about that if that's, that's a, a kind of another topic, but... Um, that would be my advice, is that I think somewhere along the line it became that you teach when you, when you become, okay, you didn't make it, or that was that thing you had to do to pay the bills, and I think that that's exactly right, what Jana's saying, which is, it's not true. We said, I, McKinney and I hosted a, uh, a session at a conference with Marty a few years back called Those Who Can't Do and Those Who Can't Teach Too. Because it is about finding for you what, what's your, what's, I mean, it sounds very crunchy, but like, what's your piece? What makes you happy? Is it, and who, whatever part of that this is, and it have, if it has nothing to do with theater, that's great. Because if it makes you happy, I mean, it's, it's hard out there, right? And you'll figure that out in a few years. Um, so don't feel like you've resigned anything, or if you don't go to New York, you're not a failure to the theater world, or um, if you stay wherever you are, or you do teach, or you work in a camp, or if you work in the box office, just because you wanted to stay connected in some way, or if you choose to not do it any of it at all, because like you said, the skills you're getting now are already pushing you so much further than half the people entering the job market. So be confident in your choices and also know that you're young and what the choice you make next year does not define your rest of your life. You can come back to this in five years and six years. You can decide to go and realize it's not for you and move home and that's okay too. And I think we saw that with a lot of our friends who went and f kind of went home with their head between their tail, you know, whatever that tail between their legs. I didn't make it. I, you know, I'll go back and I'll just do this and don't tell anybody. And this was before Facebook, right? So yeah. <laughs> you could stay quiet and hide. And I, and, and time and time again, we see that, and that's just not true. Mm -hmm. And the the country is very big, and and we've got people who graduate from this program who are doing great work in, like Mar uh, Jan said, in very small towns or in Chicago or in LA or in New York or just wherever. So find out the elements of why you've decided to be a theater major. There's a reason, or a minor, or whatever it is you are. Um, there's a reason that brought you here. There's a reason that made you say post high school, yes, I want to continue this. So what is what do you love about it? And then find some path that lets you do that every day in some fashion. If it doesn't pay the bills, I have to say, and, and we've been friends since 1994. Yeah. Um, 
which is a whole other story uh, <laughs> of how I met January. Um, but we, I was one of those friends. I remember sitting in a cafe, coffee shop with you going like, I can't, I just can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't do the business. I give her so much credit. And she has, she has cleaned floors. She's been on Broadway and then cleans floors. Like mm -hmm. it's not, uh, you know, you have to commit to it if that's what you want. And she's an amazing, and those who do it, it's amazing. Um, it just wasn't for me. And I wanted a family and a house and I wanted a salary and I wanted a lot of other things. Um, so you just have to make the choices that are right for you. And they're all good. And your parents will be fine. Yeah, your parents will be don't fine. Don't worry about your parents. You'll take out a loan. You'll pay the minimum balance. It's going to be fine. So don't let it stress. It's a hundred bucks a month. Let it go. What does Indina mean? And no one has any security. Exactly. Who the hell has any security in Oh, I do. There, I mean, the entire country has been about dismantling do, yeah. unions. No, nobody has the, the strongest unions are the acting unions. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I mean, at this point, it seems to me that, like, since there is no security, nobody stays in a job for 40 years anymore. I mean, the, the reality is, if you are completely and totally passionate about something, you're going to find a way to make a living doing it eventually. It may take some time. You know what I did when I got run out of school? My parents were freaked because they, you know, I was raised to be careful. But they, <laughs> so, so um, I, I like made zero dollars my first year and managed to like, I know, seriously. And, and, um, but I opened an IRA with like a hundred bucks that I got for Christmas. And I told my parents I'm starting, you know, to um, do, have a retirement plan. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay. So, uh, like, I, it, it sort of suggested that I was looking at this as a business. Um, and I started out with this financial advisor who I'm with to this day. Wow. It was like the best, single best decision she ever made as far as I'm concerned. But uh, uh, she, uh, <laughs> but she thought it was a joke, you know right. what I mean? And then, but then a couple years, I, you know, I kept coming every year. I was contributing, you know, and I started to get to the point where I can contribute to this IRA um, up to the max that you can contribute and write off. And, um, and, I, and slowly but surely, um, I started to make a living. And then um, I was investing. And you know, pretty much I got to, you know, I, 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 I could retire. I can retire. And it was because I treated this pursuit as a business from the outset. I didn't know what it, how it was going to look. And I certainly didn't have business cards. And um, I didn't even have headshots. But I figured out. Um, that that was going to have to be the approach that like I'm treating whatever this thing is as a business, and um, uh, my parents sort of relaxed. I mean, I think they started to believe it was going to happen because it looked like it had a little infrastructure to it, you know. So, yeah. and it and it helps you to do that too. It's mm -hmm. not just about like I mean, getting yeah. your parents off your back is great, but if you tell yourself it's a business, yeah. it's not just random, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know when I'm going to be making money. So, well, when I do make money. Yeah. When I'm making money, when there's fifty dollars, it goes yeah. in this place, and just the structure of that changes the way you perceive your own, the, how Absolutely. seriously you take yourself. Which and it goes beyond perception because right. it's this, this thing called compound interest, and basically, <laughs> you know what I mean. The, That's why you need that I economics mean, course. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't know anything about economics, but I can tell you this empirically that if you actually start saving, and I mean like the 10 extra dollars you have at the end of the month, if you save that instead of spending it on bad beer, like, <laughs> um, ser seriously, I mean, you should drink a lot of beer, definitely. <laughs> but, um, but it actually does create freedom. You know, there will be a point not too long into your career where you can actually make some creative decisions um, <laughs> that aren't out of desperation because you have money that you've been putting away for yourself. So, anyway. I was just going to say the, the thing I wish I had known, and this was because it didn't really exist yet, was this idea of being a teaching artist. That if you do decide to make the trek to the city, or, or even here, I mean, Westport Playhouse I work with, they have an education. Most of your major theater companies have an education or an outreach department, and they all need somebody. Hartford Stage, the Bushnell, everybody locally, Long Wharf, they all do. Um, it's a great way to make money. So even if education's not your thing, and this isn't the path you want to go, um, I was making $125 an hour as a teaching artist. Um, the range is anywhere from 55 to 175, depending on how long you stay and in your experience and as those things go. Um, but it's a great kind of alternative or supplemental to waiting tables. So that's a, that's a great 
um, thing. The other thing is, while I was here, the greatest thing I did was I, well, I did everything I could. And I think now it's part of your curriculum, um, which it wasn't, there was no infrastructure at the time, but I did sound, light, I did everything. Mm -hmm. I Me hung too. these yeah. lights, um, mm -hmm. costumes, I taped your bathing suit to you sure in did. my freshman year. That's and great. Um, <laughs> And just any experience you can get because it all goes, because you'll leave here and you, your resumes will be small because you're young, as they should be, but you can put everything. I worked at the Quick Center as a house manager. I mean, literally anything you can do goes on that resume. Mm -hmm. and, I was offered three jobs. I mean, I don't tell you that to say like how great I am. I'm telling you that to say it was because of it was because of TF. It was because I was on the board. It was because I did PR. Because Mar uh, Lynn taught me how to hang a poster straight. Because <laughs> that was a challenge for me in the beginning. Yes. They were always sideways all across <laughs> campus. That's because your classes. Because I was always I had like an inner ear thing. And stuff. But but take every opportunity you can. That, What's great about TF, that you already all know because you're here, is that it's small and that you've created this ensemble and you don't even know it. And you've created this long-standing uh, ensemble that goes here and to everyone else who graduates. And I know when I first graduated, Marty would say, oh, do you know so-and-so? She works for this. And there would be an email and then they would call and, oh, you're from TF and let's have a drink. And I do it now and I, I know I love it. And mm -hmm. so I think start there, find out who's doing the kind of work you want to do. Don't be afraid to ask for a coffee. Um, people love to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, didn't you end up working for MTC too? I did. And um, you're I now meeting them. Because I, I said to her, oh my God, you want, we have a history yeah, of TF folks at MTC. I think John Tell was them. The first. Mm -hmm. John Power oh, you guys first. need to talk about John Danny Power. Williams. At well, some, at, but, and then Danny Colleen Williams. got a job there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. during the intern program. There's been at least a dozen at It's this true. Point. And yeah. because, you know, in Fairfield, you know, there's there's so many of these, oh, I'm you know, not at a big university, I'm not at a big theater school. This <coughs> Fairfield goes a long way in certain circles, in certain things, and especially in this area, it is extremely well-respected mm -hmm. um, for in the theater industry and not at anything. Um, and so you never know who's going to pop up and... MTC just has a little yeah, soft spot for Fairfield. Right. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, I've been out of this school like almost 20 years now. It's just a fancy sounding name. Like you say to people like you went to Fairfield, they're like, oh yeah, Fairfield. I know you have no <laughs> idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like you say it with confidence and then if they ask you anything, you're like, oh, it's Jesuit, New England. They're like, oh my God, yeah, like the Pope. You know, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> it's just sell it. I have, to, I have to say this, so now in my job, <laughs> I certify theater teachers for the state, and so this, you have to have some sort of BFA, BA um, in theater. And I look at, I look at probably over my eight years, I've probably looked at over a thousand theater transcripts. And I'm not just saying this because I'm here today, sitting next to Marnie and Lindsay. Here. I'm not kidding. You're, you are getting an amazing liberal arts education. The fact that you have to do everything that that when the state says a theater teacher has to know these things. You'd be surprised at how de the deficient mm -hmm. some of the transcripts that come from the big schools, from, you know, we all know them, mm -hmm. that come out that they have not had a well-rounded education, and particularly in theater history, in tech, in lighting design, they have none of these um, courses. They know nothing about it. And so I have, I have to basically remediate my theater teachers, and they have to take some undergrad courses, and they have to go back and take them so that they'd be qualified for the state to teach this work. Um, so I, that's, that's something, too, that that I didn't know then, mm -hmm. you know, that I was walking out really prepared. Yeah, because really you can't do, you can't, sorry, really yeah. quickly, like you can't, you can't do liberal arts in grad school. You can only do liberal arts now. I didn't un even understand that structurally before okay. I graduated. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so much better than a BFA. Do your liberal, ar do your liberal <laughs> arts, embrace the fact that that's your opportunity. And then if you want to do more acting, do it in grad school. If you want to do more right, design, right, right, right. do it in grad school. You want to write more, do it in grad school. But this, this is your shot mm -hmm. at liberal arts. I agree with you 100%. I said this to Maggie back inside. I said, you know, the faculty here have put together a really good program. And, you know, I didn't realize it until after I got out. Uh, I was like, well, I don't really want to do it. I don't want to be a designer. Like, why am I taking these design courses? <laughs> but it's, 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 it's actually helped me as a manager. It's helped you as a theater educator. It's helped me as a company manager and as a general manager because I need to straddle the world of, 
I work for the producer, but I also am at the theater every night with the crew. And all the department heads are like, oh, we need a bulb change. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I, I need to go up to the producer and be like, okay, we need a bulb change, we have this, we have that. It's like, just, and you know, I'm not an expert in, uh, in carpentry or electrics, but like, I have a general understanding. And that's perfect enough for to get by, that I could communicate and I could translate theater speak to the, <laughs> to the investors, to the producers, and it's, it's, it's really helpful, and I didn't realize it until I got out. Yeah. And also having more than the sort of dabbler's sense of the context in which we create things, uh, knowing uh, your theater history is so mm -hmm. important. Uh, again, I probably didn't know how important that was until I was in a position to have to sort of reference something <laughs> or hear someone else's reference, you know, being in a position where I'm selling myself and knowing what they're talking about when somebody says Juno you know, and the Peacock or you know whatever it happens to be and like thinking back to you know um, the I think this context that you created in my life um, it, it, it's invaluable I know what every one of those books still looks like mm -hmm. you know I really do and and I know I know where you know Long Day's Journey and Tonight I know where I was sitting in the library when I read it the first time and for your class and taking notes in the in the margin and. Um, and I still have all of those books, but having that kind of context, so you you know what you're talking about. And let me tell you, I just I mean I literally just came back two days ago from Sundance where I had a film, and that is another context right there. I'm realizing that everybody in this room is is making a film and is now showcasing a film that will determine the sort of course of. Um, what people are creating that will that will reach a broader audience in the next five years, and so it's being able to sort of suss out from the program context, and realizing that none of us creates in a bubble. Like we all, you know, it's like you know, um, Karl Lagerfeld, um, one of this sort of like savant qualities he had. You know, the designer Karl Lagerfeld. Um, for Chanel. For, yeah, he could, he could tell you what every single designer in Paris was going to do for their next spring show, their next fall show, and then the year to come. Because he had such um, a connection to the context and the zeitgeist. And um, I, I think you, you, can't, you can't go wrong by, um, by just knowing what other people are doing. And the only way you can, you can put that into any kind of context is by knowing your history. So it's read the plays. Read the plays. Do your homework. Yeah, do your homework. <laughs> That's our advice. Mm. This might be the golden moment for questions. So what are you burning to ask? Yes, Stephanie. Um, through all of this, where did you find your drive to keep going? Like, all of you have hit a wall somewhere. Like, what was the fire inside of you that kept you going? Rent? You have to pay your rent. <laughs> right? I mean, you have to. Yeah. I well, thought you were talking about the oh, musical. Well, I mean, I have another. another I found myself we had that poster. I was, all of my, I was, when I was when I was a recent grad, all of my friends were just miserable in their jobs, and I was happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I liked what I was doing. Like all, and I just remember thinking, like, oh, my friends are miserable. I was like, they don't like their jobs. I was like, I like my job. Mm -hmm. I like I like coming to work every day. I just never feel like I get it right. And I just want to keep getting, I just want to try harder. I want to get it right. I'm like, and have you seen The Great Beauty? Graham Belaitza, it was the Academy Award, uh, Foreign Academy Award winner last year. Um, it's this absolutely exquisite film about this man who wrote one great novel and is now in his 60s and has not followed it up with anything except for celebrity interviews for like magazines. <laughs> and um, everyone keeps asking him, when are you gonna come out with this next thing? When's, what's in, when's, when? And you, you, the whole film is about him waiting for the great beauty. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I just, I just, I just, I, I just wanna create something excellent. And um, I feel like I only ever get a C you know what I mean? And I think that's the, that's the creative drive, right? Because getting it right is like dead energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're done. So I, I think that's the drive. And if you have that, 
like, I mean, usually the guy who walks out of an audition is like, nailed it. <laughs> he totally didn't. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's the totally. one, right? It's the one who's like, oh, I just didn't hit that fucking note. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, so, and they're like, okay, so wh- what can I control about what went wrong? First of all, what went wrong? Mm-hmm. And then what can I control about it? What was out of my control? And what will I do so I'll be better at it next time? That person's the one who has the long haul career, mm-hmm. you know. And and I just um, am constantly in this state of reassessing what worked, what didn't, what um, was in my control, and what wasn't, because so much is out of your control. But knowing what you can focus on to like do it better next time is the key to it. And it's and I think it's the drive. It's the drive of the artist to like to get it better, to get it right. You know? You'll know, you won't be happy yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've had some pretty extraordinary opportunities um, to work with people who are just the best at what we all do. Mm-hmm. And being in the presence of those people, those are like holy moments in my life. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I know, you know, August Wilson, who I revere among all playwrights. Um, passed away about 14 months before I did his play in New York and I never got to meet him but I know him so well I've done three of his plays now Um, I just did Joe Turner's Come and Gone in LA with Felicia Rashad directing it and the actors I got to share a stage with it was like church. It was like better than anything. I, I sat on that stage every night and learned more about humanity and had a meeting with August Wilson every night. You know what I mean? Like you're, we, with this thing that we do, we go into a room where there's nothing. There's nothing in this room right now. <laughs> and we make life in this room. And I remember when I was doing my first off-Broadway show, I was down at the Actors Playhouse, which I don't even think is a theater anymore. Mm. And there was a bunch of people in their 20s with no idea what they were doing. We couldn't figure out why anyone had given us money to do anything. <laughs> and don't tell them. We don't know what we're doing. And I remember realizing, I'll never forget this, I remember realizing, standing backstage right before our first preview, that the feeling that I have before I go on stage, I'm going to cry, sorry. The feeling I have before I go on stage um, at the beginning of the run of a show is exactly like the feeling I have when I fall in love. Mm. It's like, oh my gosh, my heart's racing, my palms are sweaty, I'm like freaking out, I can't like organize my thoughts, I'm just going toward all these, I, you know, it's like that rush of emotion. And that's, you know, I will, not every project that you get to work on is August Wilson or Shakespeare or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, but you learn what you can from the moments when you're kind of treading water and just doing stuff that has come to you. Maybe that'll be interesting. Maybe that'll keep me busy. Maybe that'll pay the bills. But then to have those moments where you get to work on Shakespeare, mm. you know, where you get to, to be next to an actor who you've watched from afar for a decade on stage. And then all of a sudden you're sitting in a room with them trying to figure out this script. I mean, yeah, that's what keeps me going. And you can bring that level of consciousness, you know, I, to, to anything. You know, I mean, in an odd way, I, you know, I, I, I have this one friend who's a, who's a theater director and, and teacher in New York, um, and uh, she, she's convinced that there's just sex and money, meaning like you, you can get the sexy job, you know, or the love project or the labor of love that people talk about, or there's money. You know, it's just like one, you know, or that's the money job, you know. And I just, you know, first of all, I spent so much time doing a money job that um, before I committed to doing it for another chunk of years, I was like, how am I going to bring that feeling, Mm -hmm. that consciousness to the work so that, I mean, honestly, the money is not a very good motivator. It really isn't. And um, there's this... Okay, so there's this feeling, you know when you, just, you don't feel good about what you did in the show, and like the curtain call is kind of a moment of embarrassment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, you know that feeling, right? <laughs> I have no idea yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, you've always been brilliant. Um, but um, I just wanted, I, you know, I was doing all these, I would do like 50 
commercials a year, and I, I was working with these like amazing directors who were doing like important films and you know had Academy Awards and you know cinematographers who'd worked with the great directors, and but it's just their money job, and I didn't want to be embarrassed when I left the set, and I was like, oh, I've been doing a really good job of like imitating what I thought they wanted to see for years and doing a good job because I was making money doing that, I kept my job. But um, I wanted to leave the set like feeling as though I brought um, the consciousness and artistry to the work, as silly as that sounds in a commercial, but I knew and I was so that I, I could leave the set with my head held high. And um, that was all about going back to the basics and the work, and as silly as it sounds, like doing a scene analysis on that one page uh, that I would get, and doing a serious, like, conscious scene analysis, bringing my theater training to play on that one page where most of the time I didn't have any dialogue at all. I just had some stupid expression that I was supposed to give. And um, I was like, I'm, I, I want to have that feeling so that I know that I've, I, I can leave here um, with my integrity intact, you know? And um, I think you can do that in almost any job, and like the dumbest part. And um, uh, so that it's not so few and far between, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. And also yeah. I just have to say, hearing you say that right now makes a lot of sense because you, you, you had a an extra. I don't need to tell you that was an extraordinarily long run, and I mm. guarantee you, that's not because that's because of the work he was doing. Right. Mm. Like, you know, you, especially with with you know commercial, basically spokespeople and pitch people, people get annoyed and they get tired mm -hmm. of watching it, and so the ad agency goes, "Oh my God, we need to change things up." But like, how many years was it? Um, I, I mean, I've been under contract for 13 years. That's insane. Uh, that doesn't yeah. happen. It doesn't Is this happen. a record? It Is it a record? Happen. I don't know. It might I mean, be. I think it's probably the number of spots, because there were so many of them, is a, is a record. I mean, I, I, in terms of length, probably not. Um, working on it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, but that, I mean, those two things are not, yeah. not yeah. dependent on each other. And so you're hearing it right here. There, that's proof that if you decide to bring your work at this, to the simplest thing you do, it mm. will pay you, not dividends, I mean cash, but like it will pay you dividends in more work and mm. more happiness and probably then more money too. It's mm. true. Another question. You know, no uh, can, I, can I throw one thing out there too? Please. Um, all of this I know just seems so sort of like 30 steps away from where you're gonna be when you land with your like diploma in your hand. I mean, honestly, the skill to develop is being the person that someone would trust with their cat while they're on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, because, you know, I, I look around this room and I'm like, you know, any one of you could be on the set of a film that I'm producing, working, and the one who's, who like walks with this energy of like, oh yeah, you can trust me with that, I've got it, I got this. You know, that's the one I'm gonna be like, um, Hillary, go, if you could just, it, it, she needs, and if you could just do that thing. If you're the one I go to, you're the one who on the next project will be like, you have to have Hillary, and this time we can actually pay her. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or we'll, you know, and so I, I just feel like that's the skill to start developing now. Instead of being like, uh, the way you probably feel a little bit, which is like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I honestly, I mean, all this sounds great, but like, I don't know how to pay rent. Like, I don't know, pay rent? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like all of this stuff. So, I mean, I think part of it is kind of developing that. Be the person that someone wants to help, you know? And do that be by nice. being the person that nice. wants your help. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, and that, those are, those are skills you develop now. I get, yeah. uh, when I was, because being a TA is like being an actor where you're just kind of always kind of looking for the next job and you get on a lot of rosters and they want you in the schools. And you get good work gets work, and people will say you want to work with Jen. She's nice. She's low maintenance. She's nice. She'll show up. She'll do good work. She'll stay out of your hair. That's mm -hmm. it's the same idea. It's being competent. Mm -hmm. um, 
somebody who shows up on time early. Uh, yeah, just does good work, and then you get the next job, and the next job, and the next job, and you figure it out from there. But mm. you know, empathy is like one of like the, the actor's great tools, and so use that in the room with people who are in a position to help you. Meaning, like anticipate what their needs might be. What is that? And and you know, that's a practice of empathy in a way. You know, and um, and that's a skill that you already have because you know, if you're an actor, I mean, it's just a it's something that you're constantly nurturing. And so use it in those situations too. And I think, you know, approaching a situation and anticipating what they're gonna need, it's gonna um, be really helpful in an acting job and like kind of any other job too. Just because that person is perhaps hiring you or is mm -hmm. in what you perceive as a position of power, yeah. doesn't mean that they're happy, that they don't have needs, that they don't have mm -hmm. insecurities, uh, that they don't think they're doing a C job with everything they're doing. And mm. if you're open to that and exuding empathy, that's a great thing. Mm. Yes, Carol. I'm from a different field of studies. Like I'm graduating social communication in Brazil. But theater was always my passion, and mm. I didn't get to study that when I was in Brazil. Because whatever. Uh, I would like to know your advice for people that is from other fields, if they can contribute or can, how they can change or can, how they can go to work in that, like how you could go to, to join you in the, all this magic that you're saying for us now. Mm -hmm. I mean, primarily be the person who I would trust with my cat. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I think that's the way in, right? I mean, when you are on a deadline and you know something has to get done and it absolutely can't be messed up, mm -hmm. and uh, you're, you're, aren't you going to, I mean, any one of us would go to the person that they know they could trust with their cat. Be eager, be proactive. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> go with it. Yeah. Uh, know how to write a grant. And I can tell you that anyone I know who works in like downtown theater is going to be like, we'd like you to be in our company. Right. Yeah. You know how to write grants? Yeah. We so, love you. Yeah. 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 Take a grant writing course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Big time. And not necessarily, you can take grant writing courses anywhere. It doesn't yeah. have to be a college level course. Yeah. yeah. And I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that you'll be the one who works. If you know how to write a grant proposal, mm -hmm. every downtown theater company in New York will know within a year and a half that you're the person to call. If if they need, you could, you, if They're I were going to invest in a business right now, always. it would be investing in, the, in, in a small consulting firm that does nothing but grant proposals for downtown theater. And it's actually not a mysterious thing. It's just yeah. something you have to devote the time to learning how to do and then devote yeah. the time to writing many proposals because you're not going to get every grant. You, mm -hmm. you know? And also researching the right foundations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no. there are tools, there are websites and mm -hmm. uh, where you can uh, go and... Um, I think it's actually TCG actually has something mm -hmm. where you can go and research all different, you could, a theater company could go mm -hmm. and research all these different foundations and find the one that's right for them and then get the writing, mm -hmm. get the writing to them, get your proposal. Mm -hmm. Ah, Hello, Lynn. Not a last word. Um, thank you all for coming back. It's so marvelous to see each one of you again. But my question is, is the question that no one is asking, is if you get an email or a phone call from any one of our students who says, hey, I'm in the theater program at Fairfield, will you respond? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. In like a sickeningly work-obsessed, timely fashion. <laughs> <laughs> or the opposite of that. Well, can, yeah, but in the general, in the general sense, can I, can I just look, a bit of advice? Um, in that situation, no matter who you're calling, who's in a position to do something for you. Just remember uh, two things. One, don't ask a favor of someone unless you know the answer is going to be yes. Mm. You won't always get that right. Sometimes you're gonna be like, but you don't, you, and, and usually you only get one ask. So save it and, and don't scatterbomb, you know? Don't use the Scud missile approach. Like work on your own stuff, work on your stuff and then know that when I call this person, I'm gonna be exactly, uh, this is exactly the person I should be calling. Mm -hmm. And I am aware of the fact that I'm only gonna get one try at this. I've got people in my head 
that I know when the right situation comes around, whether it's the right role that I write for them or the right, I know that I can call them. Mm -hmm. But I've been saving them for years in my head, waiting for just that right moment because there actually is nothing worse mm -hmm. than, blowing than, than blowing that, that, that chance. And I'm not saying like, oh, the, the, any one of us up here is like such a great call to make. You know, like we're, we're gonna be the, the key that unlocks, you know, the, the golden doors. You know, but I do think, I do think it's, 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 it's worth that, which is why I said at the beginning, like, follow careers. I mean, if you think someone may be a contact, like follow their career, get involved with them. Like I said, so much of it is public now. So follow them on their, their Instagram or follow their Twitter. It's not something you have to ask for. It's something you can just do because it's public. See their work, learn about their work, you know, um, and then, and then be like, oh, you know, I, I could do this for that person. So there's like, a, not like I look for everyone who calls me that I, I expect them to do me a favor. It's not the mafia, <laughs> but but there is like a there is a sense of like the person on the other end of the call or the other end of the email is going to be like, oh, this, this person's got their stuff together. Yeah, yeah, of course. So you know, I know exactly why they're calling me. Here's a like full circle Fairfield example of that. The very first person in the theater department of Fairfield University that I became friends with is a man named John Power. It's so appropriate that we should end this with John Power. Um, yes, John Power is quite a powerhouse. No pun intended. He is he's the vice president of casting for television for uh, Warner Brothers Los Angeles. He has a corner office literally on the lot. He has like a golf cart with his name on yep. it. <laughs> John is one of my best friends in the world. He's been at both my weddings. Um, he's, <laughs> um, no, I mean, we've been on vacation together. We lived together for five years. He's one of my best friends in the world. I have never asked John for a job. You know why? Because John, is above my level. I'm not there yet. And I've been working for 20 years. And I'm not there yet. I might not get there until I'm in my 50s or my whatever. But I have been watching. Mm -hmm. I know everything that goes through John's, you know, pilot season comes along and I look and I see. And when that thing comes along and I know I can nail it. Because sure, there are 10 roles every season for somebody who looks like me and you know, blah, 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 you know, type wise. But when, when that project comes along that, oh, I know that writer and I know that director and God, I'm so passionate and I know that's my part. I will make that one phone call to my best friend. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not, just, it's, it's not just a theoretical like, oh, you shouldn't ask people for things. You shouldn't ask people for things until you know you can deliver exactly what they need and it, it's a win-win. Because when it's just a win for you, nobody's interested. Hmm. You know, it's got to be a win-win, and and that's kind of like life too. You know, like just, but it's 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 true, and and you hold on to that stuff, and you wait for the right moment, and we can't thank you enough for being here.